here with a special guest today, my best friend, Chelsea Maker, who is an artist of many talents, musician, artist, jewelry maker, painter, performance art. I mean, the list goes on and on. She's in a band with her husband called We Are Makers, but she's also uh, someone who is a healer, an integrative healer, but also um, studied shamanism and has over 15 years of experience all the way back to high school where you actually went to that place um, in Florida that is so well known for being like the psychic city where it's like the highest concentration of psychics and stuff in the world. And just to give you guys a little background, um, Chelsea's mom had seen her abilities and believed in them and wanted to help her. So she took her there, which is so cool because now when I see it popping up as like, oh, cool places, cool spiritual places around the world, um, I was like, is this the place that your mom took you to when you were younger? Um, So she's someone who this has come naturally to her her whole life. And we tried doing this episode. We did this episode once before and we had some technical difficulties and we're, we're, we're certainly having those technical difficulties again today. It's reminiscent of the first time we attempted this. So, Chelsea, welcome to the show. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. How are you? Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, let's get into it. Also, the place that my mother did take me to is called Casadega, Florida, if anybody is asking. I think a few people were. Um, super cool. It's a spiritualist camp. Um, actually I'm going to walk you through how I even got there. So I had natural abilities, which I think everybody does, but my perception to them was more open, I guess, from a young age. And by the time I was going through puberty, I could not like deal with daily life of like, I saw spirits, I would get dreams, I would do all of these things. Um, So I asked my mom, I was like, I need help, like, using this gift in some way. And so she took me to this place where my cousin had gone also. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely in the family. So my cousin had gone there. She's like, you have to take her. There's a directory. There's, like, a little town country store in the center of Casadega. And there is a phone in the place and a book that's like a three ring binder okay so you open the book you flip through it and whatever person you land on with your intuition there's their phone number and you call them say I would like to make an appointment with you so I landed on this woman named Reverend Maida Jones and I called her and she said yep walk to my house down the street, whatever. So I literally leave this country store. I walk to her house in this spiritual neighborhood. And I'm on her porch. And she only allows me to come in, not my mom. She's like, okay, you know, we'll do you separately. I just bought tarot cards and, like, Ouija boards and all sorts of, like, stuff, right? She's like, you got to knock all that shit off. She's like, this is your mission, you got to do this. You're going to be working in this world in some way. So you need to learn, A, how to turn this on and off like a light switch so you stop getting bombarded. Um, and you need to learn how to, like, protect yourself and maneuver. But also, what is this gift to develop? She said, pick three things. So I picked mediumship because that was happening a lot at the time. I picked energy work, so I was super fascinated. I got this book from a used bookstore called The Healing Energy of Your Hands. It has, like, two hands like this. It's not Reiki. It's something else. Um, But it was just really interesting, so I was like, I want to delve into that. And then I learned about chakras. So those were the modalities I ran with, and I just would go to all of these old bookstores and look in their occult section and just start reading a lot about how do I develop this? How do I develop this? So I started doing readings for people, which I would basically 
use my sight or consciousness. A lot of my stuff is visions and visuals. I would use my sight and consciousness to travel with this person and see what I see. I'm sorry. See what I see in their sphere. Um, so I started doing that, but I realized that I kept crying when I would do these, these sessions. I would do mediumship sessions. It's really great, except for I would cry the entire time for no reason. Like, my eyes would just cry. So after a few years of doing that, uh, I definitely felt, like, a lot of psychic attacks, a lot of... Uh, Portals were open, if you will, because I was not traveling safely. I was just kind of like, I could do this thing, so I'm just going to do it and see what happens every time. Um, So eventually it got to the point where I was very energetically heavy, and I was like, I I need more help. I need need someone that knows more than me. So I was going to Reiki classes and all these things, and I'm like, okay, what do you do about this? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. And I was like, okay, someone come in. So one day I had a meeting with my spirit guides. I had learned to do that separately. And I was like, please send me somebody that knows something more than me. I had my own salon in Nashville at the time. And I had a client walk in. Oh, shoot. I'm telling a different story. We're talking about Casadega. Did we move on, though? We're continuing. We're off. Okay, sorry. So, okay, the Casadega was when you were a teenager, and then you, a couple years after you started developing those things, so from from being a teenager to this age when then you found your mentor. Yes, and then I found a mentor. Thank you. Yes. So this woman, that same day I did that meditation in the morning, I walk into my shop, and there's this woman that's, practically glowing. She's in her 60s, but has tattoos everywhere. She's just so cool. And she comes up to me and she goes, what do you do? I was like, oh, I'm an esthetician here. I have my own salon, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, no, no. What do you do spiritually? Someone sent me. And I was like, what? So I brought her into my room. I was like, you don't understand. I asked for this today. And she's like, I know. She's like, let's trade. You nourish my skin and, like, keep my skin healthy and do these, like, little facials on me. I will teach you everything I know about what I've studied. It's like, okay. So I started studying with this woman once a week for about two years. And it was incredible. We'd just go over there. It was just us girls. We would do these rituals. And she would teach me about a lot about shamanic traveling. So they call it shamanic journeying. Um, A power spot, how to travel safely with your guides, how to do these things. And we worked on all of all of the portals I made. We had to close down all of these contracts I made with these other beings on accident. I had to close down all these places and, and ways that I used to travel. I had to close down and go through a new very safe, very trusted uh, way of traveling. And it it changed my life and opened endless things for me. So now I just want to teach that. I've been practicing that, doing sessions for people, doing shamanic journeying and integrative healing for, God, 10 years. So we're yeah, eight to 10 years. Now I'm ready to kind of teach it in a group because working one-on-one is great and it's absolutely amazing and you could get a lot out of it, but like teaching a group and showing people how to do it, it's even better. So that's my background. Glad we got here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And also um, she has a class coming up. Yeah. So it's, the class is going to be July 9th. July 9th. July 9th. And Sunday. so what this woman taught you was shamanism. Yes. And basically, you know, we did talk about this the last time we did this episode. But um, it's so fascinating because 
this concept of what shamanism is is kind of like not what it actually is. And that's what I learned from you. My concept of what shamanism is was something basically like a medicine man or a um, basically someone, a member of like an indigenous group that is the leader. And that is one definition. However, what I have learned from you is that shamanism is a way to travel safely between realms. And it's kind of not a specific technique or modality, but it's a similar process of traveling between worlds, realms, dimensions in a safe way. So it's using, and that's the power spot, right? So this like idea of the power spot, that is in all different types of shamanism? Yes. Um, Yes. So in a lot of different shamanic practices uh, across the world, they have a set of practices to get through to the other side, which is very similar in a lot of ways. When, when we're talking about walking between worlds, when we're talking about walking between realms, not just connecting to spirit or the universe or God or whatever. So doing that, there's these things that you do every time, and these are safeguards. This is similar to, uh, I know Jen practices the Silva method, how there is a sequence that you go through every time to get to that space is the same thing. It's it's a safeguard. It's so you know where you're going uh, and that you don't stray from where is safe for you to go. Because once you're past the veil, it's a whole different ballgame. It's a whole new world. It's very, it's bigger than we can even fathom. And you don't know what is lurking or hanging out out there. That's why I love to teach shamanic journeying is you travel with your guides. You learn how to travel with your guides. You learn how to ask for them to help you. And they are the masters of what they do. So they know exactly where to go. They know exactly who to take you to and so on and so forth. So let me ask you, though, what is journeying? You know, people use this term journeying, but what is journeying? Okay, great question. It's kind of like a meditation. It's kind of like a visualization, but it's with the intent to embark on something that you need to retrieve for yourself. Okay, so let's say you're setting the intention for your journey to receive whatever guidance around your job you need to uh, receive, okay? So you would go in, you would ask your spirit guides, everything, do the whole lineup. That journey that you would go on, you would get the information, the energetic tune-up, the wisdom, a visual or a sound or anything that you actually need. That's your doorway in. So then you come back and you integrate that. And that's it. So Emily's asking about breath work also. So breath work, is it connected to shamanism? Yes, absolutely. There is definitely. Breath work is, again, one of those things that is kind of universal. When you're tapping into altered states, it's used, again, across the board, across the world of different ways to enter into these altered states. Coupling that with drumming a lot of times is used in shamanic journeying because it's keeping you in a beat of movement, but it's also grounding you back in this reality. And that's something also important of why you should travel in a safe practice because when you're just launching off doing astral traveling or so on and so forth. Oh, shit. I'm not looking at it. I'm so sorry. Yes, yes. Can you guys hear me? No, you're just, I'm just telling okay. you because it's, if it goes red, it will probably. Okay, it's flipping. Or at least that's what they've told me already in the comments. Which, like Natasha said, it wouldn't be a Tuesday Night Live without the tech, without the technical difficulties. It really wouldn't, you know? So just letting you know. 
<laughs> Bear with us. Okay. We're not the tech girls, but we got you on other places. So, okay, so breath work, yes, again, is excellent. I, I also teach breath work. It's an incredible tool that is kind of undeniable no matter what faith or, or anything that you've prescribed to. It works across the board. It's great. And it does couple with. with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about one of the big things that I'm asked about all the time, um, dreams. So because when it comes, when you are talking about shamanism, you have experience in these different realms, in these different worlds. Where do dreams fall? Is that like another dimension? Is there a dream realm? Are dreams going into different realms and places is it one could it be a lot of things okay so in at least what i've studied about dreams it's a different realm for sure and a lot of times it's where you can receive messages from your direct like subconscious right or your soul also um or of it's kind of a window if you will because this is also where other spirits and things can come and talk to you. Uh, you'll, a, a lot of times when I would do mediumship, after we would do a session or something, people would come through in dreams and close the session out with that person without me even there. So there's a window somehow in the dream world too. But... I think interpreting dreams is a really interesting and a really fun practice. And we could talk about like a few of the top dreams. Yes. Okay. So I compiled a list of like the top dreams, top 10 dreams and the symbols and what they mean. But dreams are all about symbolism. It's how you read them. It's just like reading a tarot card. You can figure out what is it pertaining to. It gives you just kind of a different perspective and interpretation of what you would perceive in every day. So flying was one of the number one things. Uh, flying dreams often represent the feeling of freedom or empowerment. Um, water is usually some sort of emotion. It's linked to emotion. So I would pay attention to what kind of water is it? Is it rain? Is it a waterfall? Are you on the ocean? What is that? And how do you relate to that body of water? You know what I mean? Um, death may be change. Um, something that is letting go and that can be scary, but it's also just a reminder that you're moving on and you're growing. Teeth. Teeth is a big one. Yeah, that's a big one for me. As someone who doesn't dream much, I have a lot of dreams about my teeth falling out, turning into dust, turning into powder. Mm -hmm wiggling out, getting falling out, cracking, you know, every possible thing that could happen to your teeth. I that's the only dreams pretty much that I have if I dream. <laughs> dreams about teeth. Again, we're looking at what are the context clues around it? In your dream, do you have braces? Are you getting uh, like are your teeth straightening and things like that? That can mean like Oh, things are aligning or uh, I'm changing. I'm ready to come out of my shell and like show myself. Or are your teeth falling out? Like what she's saying. Are they crumbling? Are they missing? Is representative to something you're stressed about, right? Like are you stressed about something breaking down? Are you stressed about, you know, something being forgotten like dust? Are you stressed about, you know, having a toothless smile because that makes you feel embarrassed or something. Like, what are you feeling embarrassed about, really, you know? So, yeah, they're never fun, but sometimes they can be. Um, Let's see, what else? Animals. So, in shamanism, 
we believe in spirit animals, right? So in in this realm and in the other side, they'll come and talk to you and give you medicine. Um, if you have a dream about an animal, figure out what animal is it and what is the action of that animal. I had one client tell me that she was having a dream about her father who had passed on and then a snake, a giant snake that would go through her family house and they were trying to shoo it out. And it was this energy of feeling upset and scared that they were trying to push away from remembering their father, essentially, is what we got to. And it's like, oh, it wasn't so much like the snake. It's something even further back than the snake. So that's a great symbol. And shedding that. So, okay, let's see what else. Falling. We've all had one of those. Um, let's see. Loss of control. Uh, feeling like you need to gain back some authority of some sort. So, oh, yeah. Also, like, fear of the unknown or failing, something like that. Nakedness can mean, like, vulnerability, right? So being naked can be scary because you're completely shown or... Well, in a dream, if you're naked, you're usually naked in a place that you don't want to be Never naked. Be. They, like, you know... <laughs> what exactly. It so it's, it's... Again, we're all looking at context clues. There's the subject and then, like, the context of what... And how is it working together? So are you in front of, like, your family? Like, are you about to have to, like, tell a part of your or show a part of yourself to your family that you've hidden from them? Or are you in front of a stadium, you know, doing something that, you know, maybe you're singing or something and that's scary to you and now you want to do that. But, okay, and then let's see. Okay, so a um, couple of questions. Yeah, um, someone said, what would you recommend for someone trying to control their dreams? Like, say, um, lucid dreaming. Okay, so lucid dreaming is almost akin to astral projection, in my opinion. If you set parameters before, though, if you go to your power spot and you create a pathway that every time you go to lucid dream, you are taking somebody with you that knows how to navigate or that you'll use your spirit guide or some in some fashion as you navigate or program that in, then super great. It gets murky. And also, Dawn asked earlier, can something attach to you if you're not protected while you're traveling? So that was what we were talking about right before this. Yes. That's exactly why we make the safeguards and go with with the people that know how to protect from those energies, that live on that side, that, that work in that capacity we don't know how to fight interdimensional beings off a lot of the times <laughs> we have a hard time fighting 3d beings over here like it's it's more than we know how to navigate that's why we gotta have them. okay so let's talk a little bit about to um in this kind of concept of traveling between worlds in shamanism. So you've explained this once before, the difference between like the ordinary world and the non-ordinary world. And that's kind of one of like the basis ideas that is coming up in all of these different forms of shamanism. So the non-ordinary reality and the ordinary re uh, ordinary reality. So this right here, is the ordinary reality. This is the reality we all share together that makes sense to us all. Uh, the non-ordinary reality is you going, 
cast the veil into basically the quantum hologram is another way you could describe it. Um, so, wait, what was the question? Just explain what they are. What the non-ordinary reality is. Yeah, it's past the veil. The non-ordinary reality is where your power spot is, is where you travel between the realms. Uh, dreams? dreams are in the non-ordinary reality where everything's still very pliable. Here, it's kind of fixed, right? So that's, that's the difference. So there's also like a lot of spaces in these non-ordinary reality. Are these spaces consistent for other people? Mm, like, great question. if you've gone journeyed somewhere, can I journey to that same place? Yeah. Does that exist? Wonderful question. Um, and the crazy answer is yes. <laughs> it's actually wild. So uh, I've studied shamanism under several incredible people. And one, we made a, in our power spot a uh, crystal altar room like a temple we all could pass through and see if someone else had left something on an altar uh you can see other figures there but you're really on your own mission you don't intermingle uh, but you can um yes you could go to other places it's that other people have traveled to what gets even crazier is you could travel with people and go see similar things just from different perspectives, the entire journey, which is a whole nother level of what? How do we even do that? It's incredible, but it but it does work, yeah. And so I'm thinking about like some of these uh, places. So, and I feel like this is also why like a lot of times in the hypnosis, all of these people, especially with like Floris's work, Dr. Michael Newton's work, they're all describing these same places in the afterlife that they're passing through and they're describing them all kind of similar. They're hubs, they're, they look like schools, they look like transportation centers. It's like people all over going to these same places. Um, what about aliens in connection to shamanism? Okay, so this is my opinion. As of recently, with all of this alien uh, influence and news, right? Every time I talk to a being from the higher or upper worlds, which is like where the cosmos is, where you're meeting cosmic beings, um, I you receive healing from them. You could ask them where they're from. All of these things. Now I know that is connection at least to me with extraterrestrials on the other side in a different dimension um i've done it many many times and now i'm like oh i'm also starting to connect like archangels and these what i would call energetic conglomerate figures that are huge that have a very specific tune or purpose um they are also cosmic beings. They're definitely up in the higher realms coming from the same places that these other light beings are coming from. So it's very interesting. Um, the lower worlds are where your, let's say, rocks, uh, gems, um, plants, animals, all of these different other types of life and beings. Or down there. Now, the middle world, which is where when you do the astral projection and the, what is it? The dream, the lucid dreaming. You're, you're entering the middle world. And the middle world is where a bunch of other kind of beings hang out in other dimensions. So it's a lot easier to run into trouble <laughs> in the middle realm there. So... That's why, like, traveling upwards towards the cosmos or traveling down towards the earth and the inner earth is much better. Uh, 
not saying that you can't travel in the in the middle world, but that's where like your soul retrievals, your soul extractions and things like that are happening. It's just a very more intense realm. What is soul extraction? That's if it got stuck somewhere or attached to something that needs to come back. <sighs> okay, we're going in. We're going deep. So, obviously, there is, like, trauma that can happen on the other side in these other uh, other dimensions. What my purpose was and what I was trained to do was to extract the pieces, the soul fragments that have broken or uh, broke off or were taken um, and bring it back to the vessel. So, which... I'm, can be looked at as like an exorcism or so on, so on and so forth. Also, like banishing other things that are attached to the soul happens in this middle realm. And so, like, what is the difference between soul extraction, soul extraction, soul retrieval? Because um, these are words that I hear coming up with shaman, especially here in the states. Retrieval is less intense. So think of like retrieval as like smaller smaller fragments. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's a soul retrieval is like mm, it's maybe still around some sort of trauma, but it's not completely shattering. The shattering ones are the extractions when there's usually other entities or, or beings. Emily was asking, I, I think what she's asking is our souls in the same place as like alien souls and stuff. Um, our souls in place? Like, in like, like we're talking about these like upper worlds, middle worlds. I mean, what I would say from that based on the things that I know outside of what we're talking about is kind of like, I think that in some cases they are because then people are like multidimensional. So their soul right. is your consciousness is experiencing the ordinary world, but your soul is still existing in those upper worlds is what I would think is probably. Yeah. Yes. And that's like your higher self, right? Is always in those upper worlds, if you will, in contact with all of that. Um, does that answer your question? Let's see. I'm trying to think. So a lot of people are asking questions about the entity attachments. And I know because that's one of those, that's one of those topics that it's scary. So a lot of times um, people, and personally, you know, I'll say outside of shamanism, what I know based on, you know, Dolores Cannon's work and a lot of other people's work, um, but specifically Dolores, I like, her interpretation of it, and you could tell me if it lines up yeah. with shamanism, because a lot of the stuff does. Like what you're talking about with like the middle worlds, the upper worlds, all of these different things. And you guys know, you guys have seen my soul series. In the soul series, we went through all of these different cultures that break things up into three levels. You know, you have like your lower, your mid, and your higher level in the spirit world. In like it comes up again and again. Like even stuff like that comes up in some like denominations of Christianity, like even like Mormonism and stuff like that. So a lot of the stuff from shamanism does come over to the different schools of thought. Um, so with this, entity attachments. okay, so my perception of entity attachments is that majority of the time like 90 percent of the time uh these things are not like individual consciousness like us like we're not they're not like us and they're not like oh i see that person and i'm gonna target them and there is times where there is negative which is why i say 90 percent of the time because i do believe that maybe five or less percent of the time there is advanced beings that are service to self that can consciously target things. 
But I feel majority of the time when we're talking about entity attachments or any energetic attachments, I feel like the description that I resonate with is like, okay, we have our energetic field and there's, you can kind of get weak spots in your energetic field because of trauma, negative beliefs, um, all different things that cause imbalance in our body. You know, being silenced, you know, maybe you've been silenced and then you have kind of a little bit of like a weak pocket in that. Yeah. And then those entities, these attachments that people talk about, um, that they're not targeting you. They're not like demonic. They're just basically concentrations of energy. So they could be like, a lot of times the ones that we become aware of are the negative ones. But the same thing happens probably with positive. And they're like a concentration of like, say, like um, grief. So they can be like a energetic concentration of grief. And then you have a divot in the back of your energetic field because you have a lot of grief that you've been carrying around. You've weakened that area of your energetic field. And now this not creature, but it's this energy that is an entity that then is like a magnet to that energy and fills in that space and smooths it out. So they're not conscious and they're also not like then impossible to get off. Exactly. That was beautifully put. Exactly. Um, I've also How heard... People remove them? Could they remove them themselves naturally or something like that? Yes. Yes. There's many ways to do that. Now, if you did pick up some crazy force... Uh, messing around usually with things that you should not be messing around with. That's a different story. Uh, however, just like energetic buildup that comes from just being in toxic environments and other things like that and like moving through trauma. Yes, you can remove that. Absolutely. Uh, doing a bunch of different practices. Breath work is a huge one. Journeying, uh, doing some sort of tune-up, uh, yoga mudras, energy healing. There's so many things. Saging and smudging, doing literally anything with the intention of that outcome. And I think really, I mean, to what I would probably suggest as like my go-to would probably be like a, a visualization of the whole body and the cleaning, like literally visualize the energy field and visualize it being cleaned. Yes have a little vacuum. That's in actually the uh, journey of souls and destiny of souls to visualize the vacuum pulling out any dark energy. So you can kind of imagine like an energetic egg around you and see it cleaning, maybe you, however you want, you know, see a freaking turn cycle in a spin cycle in the, you know, washing machine. Whatever symbolizes, uh, that's like, you know, that's what they teach in the silver me method is that basically whatever, like if you go into that realm, if you want to heal something, you pick the visuals that you want. It doesn't matter. So like, say you want to heal, you know, your nerve in your arm after an injury, you could literally visualize yourself like as like a 3D hologram in front of yourself and like visualize a paintbrush, painting it. Or um, a little vacuum oh, or I, I had an IUD in and it caused a bunch of things. My hair was falling out. And in my visualizations, one, I got the IUD out. Two, in my visualizations for my hair to grow back, I imagined that flowers were growing out of the spots that had no hair. That it was blooming. And my hair grew back. So what choosing whatever, that's why... I, Doing visions, vision quests or journeys and things like that is so helpful. You get to see these things that you want. Yes, the vacuum. Oh, also, I would work on protection. I would learn, A, two things. How to cleanse, because that's going to remove whatever debris or anything that you've done or picked up. Two, protect. And then Three, learn how to infuse what you do want. How to, you know, open a vortex for a positive or with a with a positive intention. That is amazing. 
Okay, so tell us a little bit about your class, what you're going to teach in the class. So um, if people are interested in getting into shamanism, that'll be a different answer, a different story. We can talk about that after. Um, In your class, what you want to do is teach this aspect of shamanism that can be used to travel safely, to protect yourself, to make sure, like all of the stuff that she's talking about, like this safeguard. Um, so, so people can learn that without going through the whole journey of becoming a shaman. And you don't need to be a shaman to learn how to create this spot to safely experience journeying, astral travel, safely dreaming, safely contacting your guides. Precisely. Um, So in this class, I'm going to be teaching is learning about how to activate your power spot, how to get to your power spot, and how to create these rooms uh, or places that you can go to retrieve specific information, healing, or just to meditate, anything. You could create these spaces that are energetically sound and protected. This is the most protected place you can be. Uh, So, and this is also where your spirit guides come meet you. This is where you, this is your launching pad to journeying to the other realms. So, uh, we're going to do all of that and more. So, it's basically an intro to shamanic journeying. Um, she's asking, what is the power spot? We did talk about it a little bit earlier, but just to give a full understanding of what the power spot is, because that's also what the class is teaching you to create. So the power spot is the neutral space behind the veil. So when you go inward to do a journey, you are going to enter this other realm uh, that is the neutral place where your soul and spirit resides so you it's more than a sacred space uh a sacred space a lot of the times I feel like is in this dimension right like this is where you would like light a candle and put incense on and do this and that this is the other side this is the doorway okay so you would and after the doorway this is just a landing pad and you set it up you you understand what it looks like to you so you could identify it. You could travel there time and time again. Um, so, good, sorry. And so, like, you know, sometimes in movies, like this is in, like, Avatar or The Cell or, like, I don't know why those are the two movies that I think of that have this, but, you know, like, when they're going into a different, because those are both movies that they're going into a different world. So in Avatar, he's going into that alien world. And then in The Cell, she's going inside the mind of a psychopath. And in both of those, they kind of go into, like, a suit and then inside of, like, a tube. And then now their body, their physical body is safe in that tube and their consciousness gets to travel somewhere else. So my understanding is kind of like the power spot is kind of creating a spot like that in the non-physical. So you kind of have this like space where you can start off with and is like a safe space that your consciousness is secure the same way in those movies, how their body is in that place, their body is safe in that spot. Then now they can, you're in that spot. And what's interesting is Now, I think, too, some of the things that I want to talk about, some of the places that I've seen in the non-physical realms, and you can tell me if these are places that are other places. Maybe these are something that I've kind of created a power spot by accident. So the first one um, is one that I used to use a lot. I haven't in a while because it was just, like, naturally always popping up, and now it's not. So, like, that's maybe even, like, a question is, like, when you have these kind of spots in your mind, maybe sometimes, even with the Silva stuff, I would go to the same spots all the time, but now lately, I feel like those spots don't come easily. Like, I have to create them again. And is that something that happens? Yes. So, your power spot can shift and change as you grow and shift and change. So, like, for instance, 
Mine is a forest hallway or a forest passageway to a clearing where there's a lake. Every time I get to the power spot, I see these certain things. I have a light post that marks I'm there. Then I touch the floor and then I walk through my my path. However, that path can change. So one day it could be just like, you know, palm trees. Another day it could look like uh, avatar plants that are lit up and huge and incredible. Or sometimes they're enormous roses and it's just all that or whatever it shifts to at the time. I've seen a few different ones, but you will get to know the feeling of the space, the smell of the space, the visual cues of the space when you set these specific things up. Okay, so some of the other spots. So I had always had this spot where now I feel like it's not easy for me to um, get there again. Like I can see it still in my mind, but in meditation it doesn't come naturally like it used to. And it's basically was like a temple room and it was dark and there was a, uh, it was kind of like, it felt like being like, like, an amethyst, like I was either inside of an amethyst or like something like that. And then there's a golden um, triangle in a golden pyramid on a platform. So in the middle, there's a platform, an altar, and then and it's like kind of minimalistic and almost modern, but it's like a temple. And then one of the other ones that I've talked to you about is the Silva Method ones. So in the Silva Method, you count down from three to one. And a lot of times people just see three to one. When I did these, these were full-blown places. And the first one, I see it in three stages because you do it three, three, three. When you do each number, you do it three times. So first, and then what's even crazier is, I saw this place in real life. And after I've seen this place kind of in real life, it's not my spot anymore mentally. And it was, that was the number three. So when you have to visualize three, 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 I would see this kind of like street that was kind of like desolate, almost like a movie desolate. And then this like giant three falls from the sky, crushes a car. And then I see a couple like months later, And it's been decorated with lights and people don't park there anymore. And there's like something happening in the back. And then the third three, it's fully lit up like a carnival. And it's the entrance of this carnival. And you like kind of walk through this sandy and it's dark. It's always night in this area. Um, And then you walk through this sandy thing and there's like this old um, kind of carnival type of archway with those like bulb lights and then what's crazy is when I was in Vegas earlier this year in the beginning of the year in January I went to the neon museum literally at the neon museum they have the same archway that I walked to the neon museum is all of the retired um, signs of old Vegas so whenever whenever a hotel it, it is. They call it the they call it the boneyard. So it's a boneyard. It's a graveyard of everything that's ever like been a sign in Vegas goes and retires there. So they have like some of the most famous signs from Vegas. And the old Sahara sign is literally when I saw it and the the gravel is the same as this thing. It's literally the same. And it's an archway of the Sahara. It's the retired version of it. And I'm like, that's so weird. And when I've told you about this before, you were like, are you walking alone? And I'm not always walking alone. When I'm going into this like carnival, which now I realize is like casino, but old dead casino. um, Sometimes there's people walk. Sometimes there's people walking with me, but I can never tell who they are. And then the second level. There's kind of like this room 
that look similar to like the houses where I grew up. Some people had these multifamily houses that had this kind of specific architecture. And it looks like the inside of one of those houses. I never lived in one, but I had been in a lot. My neighbors had them. And there's this guy in a suit who kind of doesn't really have a face. And he does the number two. So when I need to see number two, he does like this. And so you've told me that these are like gatekeepers. So can you kind of explain some of like these places and how could I have seen that in real life after? And then also these gatekeeper people. Okay, so I'm going to go with the first thing that you said. So you seeing it in real life. Like a version of it. A version of it. And now it's not the place that you've used anymore. So that was like a cycle end. And what I did also tell you, I was like, that's a really dark way to enter the other side. I was like, what? It's like a creepy carnival that you walk through? That's what? <laughs> um, so I feel like through your ascension and awakening, you are going to be seeing some shifts, especially where you're at now. She's on fire, everybody. Like, please. Uh, sh- you're going to be seeing some different things. Because your vibration is changing. These new spaces that you used to, or these old spaces you used to inhabit or walk through aren't the door for you anymore, if that makes sense. How, okay, so now we're going to talk about gatekeepers. Love these beings. Okay, so gatekeepers are very neutral beings uh, that will stand guard of these places that you inhabit. Now, you ask these beings to do this job, and they are very happy to do this job. This is exactly what they've been created for, so they're very happy to do that. Um, So when you do make these places through your power spot, right, so you can, as part of your protection protocol, ask for a gatekeeper to be there. Uh, However, if it is a space that's already been made, a lot of times there will be a gatekeeper there. That's one of your indicators or your markers that, oh, I'm at the space. They'll open the door for you. You travel through. You won't really talk to them. You can thank them, give them gratitude and appreciate them. But they don't, they're not really a messenger. They are a protector of a space, if that makes sense. And so what are, are there like some common gatekeepers that a lot of people see or? Um, let's see. A common gatekeeper. Oh, you would probably see them at the Akashic Records sometimes. Oh, and that's like the, the lords of the records. When yeah. you do the prayer, those are the lords of the records yeah. who you can't see really who they are or know fully what they are. Exactly. But to you, it's a figure of some sort that facilitates that um let's see um another gatekeeper well known hmm i'm not sure okay so what about we're coming towards the end here what about the grim reaper yeah that's uh what i would consider a ferryman so Oh, he's not going to like that. He's not going to be like like being called the ferryman. No, so what a ferryman is is someone that like kind of takes you across the board. It's not so much a spirit guide. They're on like a different They're employed different, <laughs> if you will. So they let's say a grim reaper would be So I used to volunteer at hospice, okay? Something common that would happen a lot of the time was a team of beings would come to the room that the deceased or soon-to-be deceased uh, was aligned with. They would start talking to other beings in the room, and they would a lot of times say, Oh, they're here to come get me. All right. And it's a way to, ush, like an usher. There you go. Think of a Grim Reaper like an usher. Like, have you ever gone to a show and they're like, right this way, your seats are this way. Come on, blah, blah, blah. They're going to kind of like walk you to where you need to be for the next steps of processing and so on and so forth. 
Okay. We are coming near the end of our hour here. Um, so you guys can get Chelsea's class on Eventbrite. It is in the description of this video. Um, that's going to be on July 9th. I'll be there too. It's going to be fun. I'm excited to create a power spot. Um, cause it is interesting. Cause there's also too, you know, in, in the Dolores hypnosis in the QHHT, there's, you go to a beautiful place and you get to pick the beautiful place. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is there's also kind of a set beautiful place too. That is not exactly the same thing, but sometimes in the QHHT, people will go to this specific place and it's similar to a garden, to like you're saying, but it's a bit more jungle-like. Like it's a bit more, but not jungle how we see it. It's kind of like a garden, but that has like exaggerated plants, like jewels. And these things are kind of like plants made of jewels. So is this like, this is something that Dolores talks about that sometimes people will, oh, well, most people will choose their beautiful place, but some people automatically go to this same beautiful place. So do you know of this place? Yes, I have seen this place. Um, there's another place that's visited like this that's called like the Crystal Castles. Mm -hmm. And it's a realm where it's all rock structures. But when you go inside them or sit with them, you, you feel like you're spinning. It's incredible. But many people travel to them. Just like I was saying, there's a, in one of the shamanic groups that I travel in, there is a altar room that we all pass through that you can see other people's altars and instruments and things like that. So it's, it's very changeable and malleable. Depends how you program it. And so what about the void? The void is where you go when you get very lost. So that, again, why we travel with beings that are very well versed in the map over there. Uh, when you start to wander or do whatever alone and you forget where you're go going or you get swept up in the energy storm of some sort, it's hard to fall into, or it's easier to fall into the void, or if you're just not grounded at all. Uh, that's why you have spirit guides. They ground you. They know exactly where your home base is and how to safely get you back. Um, and again, would not put you in situations of danger where you could potentially wander alone. And so, yeah, I do think people can come back from the void, though. Also, what about the DMT realms? Ooh, okay, yes. So I've done DMT, I think, only once. Um, but doing journeying is very akin. You could get to the same places without substance. But this was a different doorway into, into this realm. I saw these blue beings that were basically mirrored and they were kind of moving like this and there were jesters doing cartwheels and it was a celebration. They were really happy I was there. And I said, the queen is coming. And then a queen came from the center and she went inside my body and touched my heart and said, lead with this. And then pushed me. <laughs> I traveled back uh, to this realm and that was it. Um, Again, different gateway or different doorway to that realm using DMT or something like that. Yeah, but those beings are very real. It <laughs> the jesters. There's okay. See, I don't know. Jesters to me, in my interpretation, is like. Giving some levity, like telling you to like not take it too seriously. Everything's okay. Like, and a little bit of distraction from what is actually happening. You're seeing the time knife, as you will. You're seeing all of these dimensions collapse into one and traveled and gone through all this G force spiritually to get to this place. Uh, so they're kind of just keeping things at ease. Everything's cool. It's fine. Um, 
kind of like that. I've I've never I've never seen the jesters. I've never done um, DMT before, but I've heard about the jesters from different people. Like you say, like there's like cartwheeling people that um, a lot of people see before seeing the more powerful oh, council. Oh, oh. The council. That's so cool, yeah, that like people before kind of going to a council will see jesters. That's exactly how it for, that's how it's lined up for me, like a like like a council. Yes, good place reference. Thank you. But yeah. Um oh, yeah, the machine elves. That's the other thing oh. that people see the machine elves. I that's the big know. one. Well, Guys, thank you for being here for this Tuesday Night Live. Thank you to Chelsea for being here and answering all of these amazing questions from you guys and all of the things that I've been wondering, too. This has been really fun, really informative. And a lot of the questions that I'm not able to answer a lot of times. Thank you. And thank you all for coming, tuning in, and asking so many cool questions. And Thank you, Jen, for having me. This is so fun. And eventually we'll we'll get the two mics set up when everything works. But um, yeah, have a great night and I'll see you at the class. Bye, guys. You could get the link to her class in the description. Bye, everybody. Thank you.